Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 6 starts now. Detroit City Council is just hours from voting on whether to expand the use of controversial technologies that detect gunshots. Good evening, everybody. The police chief and Mayor Duggan call ShotSpotter a powerful tool for safety. And they believe it could speed up police response by eliminating the need for a 911 call. In fact, advocates argue it could have saved the lives late last month when a Detroit man went on a random shooting spree, killing three people on the city's west side. But there are plenty of people who don't like the idea of more sensors being installed in and around the city. Priya Mann live with opinions on both sides ahead of tomorrow's big vote. Priya. Karen, tomorrow all eyes are going to be on City Hall as council plans to vote on this new technology. Council member Mary Waters is against this nearly $7 million expansion, but supporters say this technology will save lives. Is it going to stop it? No. Is it going to slow it down? That's what I'm hoping for. Reverend Charles Williams supports expanding shot spotter. The technology can detect gunfire and immediately alerts police. I believe that it'll save lives because if someone is shot, one, people, the police officers will be on the scene. But two, really what I'm hoping for is that it causes young men and women who are out there shooting guns to know that somebody's listening. Right now, ShotSpotter is used in the 8th and 9th precincts, covering close to seven square miles. If city council gives the green light, the technology would cover 28 square miles. Council member Mary Waters is against the expansion. It's clear the data doesn't work. It hasn't worked in Chicago, hasn't worked in St. Antonio, and a number of other cities. I think the trial area in the city of Detroit shows that there is a downward stroke in, in, in violence, in gun violence, uh, in the city of Detroit. That's enough for me. Council votes on the proposed expansion tomorrow. You know, we've received just as many calls on one side of the issue as on the other side of the issue. And when it comes down to the vote, how will you be voting? I'll be voting now. Well, we know how council member Waters will be voting on this roughly $7 million expansion. You know, I asked Reverend Williams about privacy concerns, about surveillance concerns, and he said if you're really concerned about that, you need to get off your phone. He hopes city council will approve the expansion. Again, that vote happening here tomorrow. Reporting live in downtown Detroit, I'm Priya Mann, Local 4. Of course, we'll be following that vote tomorrow. Thanks, Priya. In a local 4 News update, we're getting a look at the man accused in the attack that killed a local radio news anchor. 55-year-old Arthur Williamson is accused of stabbing WWJ news anchor Jim Matthews to death. He also injured three members of his family. The attack happened last Friday in Chesterfield Township. Police believe Williamson was a guest in the home, not an intruder. They say Matthew's girlfriend remains hospitalized in stable condition. Their five-year-old daughter has been released. The 10-year-old son who was attacked is in critical condition, but is improving. He did come out of it a little bit. He, he had, was showing signs, m minuscule bit of progress, which is great. I didn't think he would come this far. He was able to squeeze his Annie's hand and look up at her, uh, into her eyes, and, and, and see a, a loving family member there who's there comforting him. Hoping for continued improvement for that family. Williamson faces seven felony charges, including premeditated murder and unlawful imprisonment. Our big story, too, we are following Hurricane Ian churning over the Cayman Islands and Cuba. It's a day of warnings for people in Florida, especially along the Gulf Coast. On the right, a live look at Marco Island near Tampa, largely deserted aside from one or two people. Experts are warning everyone not to take Ian lightly. The one thing I hear most common after these disasters is if I had only known it would be this bad. And so I think that's my message to them is we're trying to communicate to you that it can be that bad. A state of emergency has been declared in Florida. Oh, my goodness. Well, Kim Adams has been tracking the hurricane. It keep, we keep getting these updates, and yes. unfortunately, it seems like it keeps getting worse. Right? It does, and it keeps getting more urgent for the people in Florida, especially along the West Coast from Tampa, Sarasota, Longboat Key, down to Fort Myer because of the storm surge. So usually we're concerned about what it comes in as, a Category 2, a Category 3. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a Category 4 while it's in the Gulf, which means it's gathering up all this water. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be one of those situations where it's not just the wind, it's the storm surge, it's right. the water, and water can be every bit as much 
devastating as wind, and in many cases, even more so. So that's what we're very concerned about here as we head through the next 48 hours. Again, people's lives, that's why the warnings going out have such an ominous tone. This could be the storm that we've hoped would never come to our shores. The threat of a force we haven't seen in our lifetime. That's the worry of officials across Florida and national forecasters in Tampa, where the last major hurricane to make a direct strike was over 100 years ago. Floridians up and down the Gulf Coast should feel the impacts of this as up to 36 hours before um, actual landfall due to the size of the hurricane. This is a really, really big hurricane at this point. Uh, the diameter, uh, the, the width of it's about 500 miles wide. The threat of Hurricane Ian triggering an installation-wide mandatory evacuation at the MacDill Air Force Base and prompting mandatory evacuations in part of Hillsborough County, where schools are now closed through at least Thursday. Officials aren't mincing words in warning people to act now. Well, you certainly can replace personal possessions. Uh, you can't bring anyone back to life. And I think these last couple of years with these superstorms, if that hasn't uh, shown us how devastating Mother Nature can be, Mother Nature always wins. This is nothing to mess around with. If you can leave, just leave now, and we will take care of your personal uh, property. Let's take a look at the track of Hurricane Ian right now, headed over the western section of Cuba, causing mudslides, heavy rain, flooding, storm surge. Once it gets into the Gulf, it will continue to strengthen. But right now, as of 5 o'clock, it has 100 mile per hour winds. As it moves out of the warm waters of the Gulf, it will become a Category 4 hurricane with winds over 130 miles per hour. Then expected to slam into the west coast of Florida. The track's still uncertain at this point, but right now, the National Hurricane Center is putting it just north of Tampa around 2 a.m. with winds of 115 miles per hour and then continuing up into parts of Georgia as a tropical storm or area of uh, as a, a tropical depression. Let's look at these winds, though, as they head into Tampa. Tampa will start feeling the effects of this storm by Wednesday at 8 a.m. I am headed down to Florida to report live over the next couple of days. So those of you that have homes and family, you will certainly get updates regularly here on Local 4. President Biden has just announced new rules requiring airlines to be more upfront about what they're charging you. It calls on airlines and online travel sites to disclose fees for seat selection, checked bags and other add ons. The White House says this would prevent airlines from hiding the quote true cost of a ticket. A trade group for the airline says carriers already disclose total costs. Airlines made more than five billion dollars in baggage fees last year. The proposal must go through a 60 day comment period before final approval. In 2020, Michigan set new records for absentee voting and people are about to get the chance to cast their ballots that way again. Paula Tutman is live tonight outside of one local clerk's office with a look at what people need to know about voting absentee this time around. All right, take it away, Paula. Okay, hi everybody. Yeah, you know what? Lots of issues energizing voters. Clerks are very optimistic. There's going to be a really big turnout, certainly bigger than many other midterm elections. Here's the thing. Voting can start for you as early as this Thursday if you choose to vote absentee. Lisa Brown is the Oakland County Clerk and Register of Deeds, and she says the number one way to get involved in the system of elections is from a first-person experience, and that is to vote. Thursday, absentee ballots can be submitted. And if you have a kid in college, make sure that they make contact to get their ballot. You cannot fill one out for them. Attorney General Nessel did go, has gone after people. I think there was a dad who forged his daughter who was in college. I think he forged her name on the absentee ballot. Um, you're going to get caught, so don't do it. And also make sure your ballot can literally be counted by the optical scanners. Those scanners cannot detect pencil red, purple, green, or any other color of fancy ink. Use either a blue or black ink pen to fill out your ballot. 
Um, if you are voting absentee when you're returning it, don't forget to sign the outer envelope and date that. It's a midterm, so you can straight party vote or pick and choose between parties. But your civic duty doesn't stop with just the candidates. There's a nonpartisan section. That's where our judges are. That's where our ballot proposals are. We've got statewide. We've got one in, in Oakland County. We've got local ballot proposals. So voting straight party does not take care of everything. So you have not finished your ballot. Make sure you check the front and back. And finally, if you've had an ill Illness or something has happened that could have changed your signature, make sure when you sign your ballot, it looks like how you signed your driver's license. That's the match. And if you need to, alert your clerk of a change. Remember, absentee voting starts Thursday. Different communities have different uh, ballot boxes. Some have some outside that are obviously uh, available 24 seven. Others have them just inside maybe their city hall or town hall. You can check to see what your community has. And remember that you have to return your absentee ballot to the community that you live in, not the drop box that's close to you, not the one that you pass on the way to work, where you live. Yeah, some really important stuff there. And if you have any concerns or questions about the security of the vote or your vote in particular, contact your clerk's office. Pay attention to social media because every single clerk's office, by law, they open up their offices for public verification so you actually have an opportunity on those days to see the process. And Lisa tells me everybody who comes in with questions, when they actually see the process, they go, yep, you know what? Yeah, my vote is secure because it is guys. All right, some good reminders for us tonight. Thank you, Paula.